Jess. Good evening and welcome to public lectures at the American Philosophical Society. I am Annie Westcott and I'm the Society's Director of Meetings. This evening, I join you not from our handsome Franklin Hall, but rather from my home, which is located as is the Society's home and in all likelihood, your own home in Lenapehoking, the homeland of the Lenape people. We at the APS recognize their continued presence and honor their community and those of other native peoples, especially through the working partnerships of our Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Following city COVID-19 guidance, the society is closed to all but essential staff, but we continue to offer an appealingly full plate of virtual presentations on our website, www.amphilsoc.org. New and of particular interest may be a recent conversation between Tony Fauci and New York Times CEO Mark Thompson, as well as a talk by Harvard Dean and W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of Social Sciences, Lawrence Bobo, entitled A Failure to Heal, Race and Politics in the United States. Both may be found on the November meeting page. In this, our season of eating, which runs roughly from Halloween to Super Bowl Sunday, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Paul Friedman, the Chester D. Tripp Professor of History at Yale. Paul came to the study of food via distinguished work in the history of the Middle Ages. Giving food the attention of a serious scholar, Paul's first book, 2007's The History of Taste, was a James Beard Award nominee. This was followed in 2016 by the 10 restaurants that changed America, the Monaco, Hojo's, Schraff's, and Chez Panisse, among other names we all know. And the new foreword to the paperback in this edition includes Philly's own Zahal, a future piece, which perhaps Paul may offer a tease or two about this evening, will arrive in the fall of 2021 and is entitled Why Food Matters. His talk this evening, however, is based on his hefty 2019 volume, American Cuisine and How It Got That Way. This presentation is closed captioned and questions are encouraged at any time. The Q&A and closed captioning function clicks are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're delighted to have Paul with us, a society member since 2011, to tell us why, unlike Chinese, Mexican, or Italian, the invitation, let's all go out for American food, is rarely heard. Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Annie. I'm very glad to be talking to you, dear colleagues, today. And um, as, as Annie mentioned, I, I have a book coming out next fall entitled Why Food Matters. This is in a Yale University Press series um, called Why X Matters, so why architecture matters, why translation matters. And I think uh, uh, there are several in this series that are by um, APS uh, members. Why Food Matters is both obvious, since it's necessary for survival and questionable. Uh, it has until recently not been considered a serious topic of high culture uh, in the way that art, uh, music, or literature are. Uh, only in anthropology has it traditionally been seen as a key to understanding societies. And there are many examples of this dismissive attitude. Montaigne uh, makes fun of a chef uh, that he um, uh, had a conversation with. Uh, this chef lectures Montaigne on salads and on sauces. Um, he says, with all the solemnity appropriate to a uh, philosophical demonstration. A and this is laughable. In the 1950s, the great chef uh, Jacques Pepin was told by his graduate advisor at Columbia that a proposal to write a dissertation related to food in French literature was ridiculous. Food is not a serious topic, uh, he was told, and Pepin gave up his plan to get a PhD and, and went back to cooking. So I'm not going to expend time justifying the use of food and cuisine to understand um, social solidarity and social conflict, uh, hoping that what follows might demonstrate some features of food significance for American life and history, not otherwise obvious. A and I should say that uh, before I begin, um, 
uh, as Annie said, my first book on food was this uh, uh, Food, the History of Taste in 2011, but I had written some other things about uh, medieval history <clears throat> unrelated to food uh, before that, and then a book about spices uh, and um, the demand for spices in the Middle Ages in 2008. Uh, if we could have the first slide. Um, this slide will show the cover of uh, my book, uh, American Cuisine and How It Got This Way. So um, this was published a little over a year ago and its title implies the question, is there even such a thing as American cuisine? Peanut butter, potato chips or gumbo identify us, but they're not really the constituents of a cuisine. And if you compare, uh, when you enter an Italian restaurant, you have the reasonable expectation that it will serve pasta. An Indian restaurant in a foreign country will have curries on the menu. While an American restaurant could feature anything from ultra modern cuisine to farmhouse comfort food uh, to an international assortment. Um, after all, anything from meatloaf to fajitas. Observers from other countries have several views of American cuisine. One is that it doesn't exist, that everything is borrowed from somewhere else. Another opinion is that America's sole culinary innovation is fast food. Or third, and more favorably, that American cuisine is um, internationally eclectic. In this country, people routinely say, I don't want to eat Thai food tonight. I had it yesterday for lunch. In most of the world, such a statement makes no sense, and not just in Thailand. Mm -hmm. For a long time, Americans have patronized restaurants featuring Chinese, Italian, Mexican, or other foreign foods adapted to their tastes. Um, and we'll look at the next slide, uh, which is a sidewalk sign in Poitiers in France, a wry commentary on the globalization of taste. There is an American cuisine, identifiably, but it doesn't consist of a straightforward set of recognizable dishes. It's based, I believe, on three things. First, an inheritance of regional cooking. Second, an early and complete acceptance of industrial, industrially produced food. Third, a love of variety. This last one might deserve a little elaboration. Variety means both the proliferation of foreign cuisines I just mentioned, as well as the many options for standard food products, dozens of flavors of yogurt, for example. That choice among a plethora of options is not the pattern elsewhere. Um, uh, let me just recount a personal experience in Italy. Uh, I was invited to give a talk at the University of Bologna on uh, a medieval history topic. And um, Bologna is, is um, one of the gastronomic capitals of Italy and among its specialties, are tortellini. Uh, in Emilia Romagna, the tortellinis are made with meat and each place has a different blend uh, of meat so that uh, in uh, Modena, there's more prosciutto, in Bologna, more mortadella. So I, I was taken to a restaurant, we had tortellini, they were clearly the best tortellini I've ever eaten. And um, uh, my host was discoursing on, you know, the sort of cult of tortellini and mentioned that in other parts of Italy, uh, they had uh, spinach and cheese uh, tortellini or things like the agnolotti in Piedmonte. And I said, what in retrospect was a typically American question, oh, well, do you ever get bored and just decide to have spinach tortellini for a change? Uh, and this was greeted uh, a little better than as if uh, uh, I'd uttered a terrible blasphemy. We're in Bologna, my uh, uh, medieval colleague said. In Bologna, we eat meat tortellini. Back home in the United States, the tortellini are not uh, as good as in Bologna, but there's a lot of choice. They come stuffed with porcini mushrooms, uh, four cheeses, sun-dried tomatoes, butternut squash, 
Variety is a way of changing the subject away from quality. It's a distraction and an inducement to ignore or forget about basic issues of flavor. So regionalism, standardized processed foods, and variety are what built American tastes from the Civil War until about 1970, when things began to change. And one of my assertions in this book is that the 1970s were a turning point. To start with regionalism, a standard answer to the statement that there's no such thing as American cuisine is to say that while there isn't a single American cuisine, many specialties uh, are uh, regional and uh, clam chowder in New England, grits in the South, a crawfish etouffee in New Orleans, or fish tacos in San Diego. Uh, this regionalism is celebrated. There are lots of Texas chili events and Maine lobster festivals. But all this activity disguises the fact that actual folk traditions have largely died out. Boston used to be famous for its baked beans, so much so that sportscasters routinely referred to the city as bean town, but that's now forgotten. Terrapin, a small turtle was a specialty of the Chesapeake Bay region and uh, of uh, Philadelphia, uh, at least uh, was caught in the Chesapeake Bay region and uh, among other places cooked in Philadelphia. It was one of the most prestigious dishes in the 19th century. It survives only uh, as the mascot of the University of Maryland. Other supposed regional specialties are neither uh, old nor place specific. For example, Florida key lime pie is an invented regional dish. A book from 1972 called Famous Florida Recipes attributes key lime pie to what the author calls pioneer settlers. But its first mention is actually in a national women's magazine just after the Second World War. And it was based on a Borden's condensed milk recipe for something called magic lemon cream pie. Indeed, there are some authentic survivals. Pennsylvania Dutch food has some traceable and distant origins. Philadelphia, once known for its uh, uh, terrapin, uh, has snapper soup. Uh, it has some quirky later inventions like um, cheesesteaks. The place that probably has preserved traditional regional cuisine against homogenization and standardization best is Southern Louisiana. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. Southern Louisiana, but actually this menu is from a restaurant, as you can see in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it's called the New Orleans House, but um, this 1961 menu features how to enjoy our clam bake, a New England specialty. And actually, if you look inside the menu, uh, this is an unusual clam bake because it features among other things, gumbo. This kind of confusion is what regionalism had sunk to by 1961, if not uh, uh, decades before. Uh, regional cuisine, there's a lot to say about it, but uh, I just want to point out how it interacts with the history of race in America, which was one of the things I focused on in, uh, in writing this book. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the African-American role in creating American cuisine was acknowledged, albeit in a patronizing fashion. But by the mid uh, 20th century, it was ignored. So James Prosser, uh, who lived from 1782 to 1861, is an example of a, um, uh, one of many examples of successful African-American uh, caterers and restaurant owners. He was the most celebrated chef in Philadelphia in uh, the period 1820 to 1860. He opened for business in 1810. He perfected a way to cook terrapin um, and um, a number of other dishes. His death in 1861 was mourned by a poem or marked by a poem by Joseph William Miller, uh, called Prosser's Journey to Heaven, or The Triumph of Terrapin. Uh, this is uh, replete with pseudo-dialect. Uh, it uh, narrates Prosser's adventures in the afterlife. Uh, and I'm not going to imitate the dialect 
uh, attempts, but uh, I'll read a few lines from this. He he at, he arrives at the banks of the Styx, and he convinces Sharon to ferry him across by offering stewed oysters, New Jersey sausage, and buckwheat cakes. On the other side of the river, the Furies stop him, and they refuse the oysters, but are then turned into docility by means of soft shell crabs fried in butter and plump reed birds. At the gates of heaven, St. Peter gives Prosser the hardest test. Even canvas back ducks and lobster salad fail to move him. It looks hopeless until Prosser mentions terrapin. From salt Delaware's reedy margins from the shores of Chesapeake comes our terrapin, good Peter. I suppose of them I needn't speak. What? Stewed terrapin, James Prosser? Open wide, the gates are born. Here comes Terrapin and Prosser. Make him welcome as the morn. Uh, so you can see this is praise of an African-American chef. Uh, it's a patronizing and um, obviously, um, <laughs> you know, uh, difficult to deal with praise. But um, that is the reputation African-American chefs had uh, in many parts of the country in the late 19th century. The next slide shows an example from New Orleans of this. This is the 1903 edition of the Picayune's Creole Cookbook put out by the newspaper. And here, uh, as the frontispiece shows, the um, the custodian of Creole cuisine, the expert, is an African-American woman. And the uh, this preface, which is uh, too small to read in the slide, says that um, because the former enslaved population of cooks was passing from the scene, white women, white women should learn their culinary wisdom before it's too late. And that is the purpose of this very detailed and actually very high quality cookbook. High quality, and it was reprinted um, many times. The next slide. Um, here's the uh, 1947 edition. And the cover shows uh, a different author of Creole cuisine, a uh, white and undoubtedly French chef. And, and much of the publicity about Creole cuisine at this time said that it came from France uh, and that it was introduced by uh, French chefs at restaurants. Um, this is at the same time that guidebooks to New Orleans uh, rhapsodized about the many influences on New Orleans Creole food, French, Spanish, Native American, um, German, uh, but uh, wrote African-Americans out of the definition of Creole. Uh, there were some responses to this invisibility or attempted invisibility. Uh, the next slide uh, is from the uh, Creole Soul Cookbook cover. It shows Austin Leslie, the owner and chef of a restaurant called Chez Hélène. Um, this is from 1980. And so Soul is a way to identify uh, an African-American uh, 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 cuisine. Uh, but Soul overlapped at times with other meanings, other terms like Southern or uh, Down Home. The restaurant Sylvia's in Harlem uh, has described itself uh, as all three. So that's uh, regionalism, which uh, uh, has declined because of the second major force I mentioned, that uh, is industrial processed food. The US was not the only country to produce dried, canned, frozen, and packaged ingredients, but Americans adopted these products more enthusiastically and completely than Europeans uh, because of their convenience, their perceived health benefits, uh, and because they represented modernity, what American was supposed to be all about. The next slide. For much of the 20th century, the American government and American corporations celebrated the plentiful and inexpensive food available to the average American. This was a key point in propagating the American way of life. This is a photograph uh, uh, for the uh, United States Information Service showing a typical housewife, 
um, as they would have uh, uh, called her, uh, unpacking the groceries. And as you can see, most of them are packaged. Um, this is a, uh, a boast uh, that American uh, agencies spread around the world. It was featured at trade fairs, at uh, world's fairs, uh, at the famous 1959 Nixon Khrushchev kitchen debate, which took place in Moscow at an American uh, exhibit. So far from hiding the industrial food system, mid 20th century companies exalted their ability to deliver a consistent, affordable and reliable product. And this is no mean accomplishment. The average American in the 1950s spent about 25% of family income on food, while through most of history, that figure has been uh, uh, well over uh, 50%. Processed food companies also touted the supposed health benefits of their products, uh, and uh, this is more dubious. Wonder Bread is a classic example. It's manufacturer disguising the fact that methods of preparation uh, leach out nutrients. And what they did was to retrofit vitamins and minerals uh, and made the claim that many of us remember from our childhood, Wonder Bread helps build strong bodies 12 ways. The entire dried breakfast food uh, cereal industry was... Um, uh, based on health claims combined with convenience. Uh, most of the world didn't accept cereals, um, things like Cheerios and Fruit Loops, which are right up there with peanut butter and maple syrup as peculiarly North American items, peculiarly in the sense that most of the rest of the world doesn't like them. Uh, cold cereal was marketed as healthful, but um, it needed to taste better and to appeal to children. And so uh, the producers added sugar claiming that this was, first of all, nutritious and that it gave kids energy. What are now simply called frosted flakes were originally sugar frosted flakes. Corn pops were sugar pops. And anyone of a certain age um, will recall the cereal's mascot, Sugar Pops Pete, uh, and the jingle that he sang, um, and I'm not going to sing it, but I'll recite it at least. Oh, the puffs are sweeter and the taste is new. They're shot with sugar through and through. In all the excitement about convenience, modernity, and healthfulness, actual taste was ignored, or it, it was put in terms of things like sugar. Mass market brands require preservation, uh, agents, texturizers, and other ways of assuring imperishability uh, and standardization, but these adversely affect taste. Artificial flavors and enhancements can't quite make up the difference. Uh, the food industry claimed that additives were good for you and that they assured quality and freshness, and, and the trade-off was accepted by consumers. What we now think of as artisanal curated or bespoke was formerly considered unhygienic and dubious. So the scientific sterile standardization was welcome. Advertisers depicted food factory workers in white lab coats, supervising machines that produced products, uh, quote, untouched by human hands. No. So variety is the third major factor defining American cuisine and the compensation for blandness. A riceroni is an industrial product, but you can choose from dozens of flavors. Uh, I, I um, made a recipe that actually is great recently for uh, chili rellenos, where the uh, breading of the peppers that are being stuffed is made with Ritz crackers and you grind them up. And I hadn't bought Ritz crackers in uh, decades. Uh, and, and, and I was shocked to discover that it's not just like Ritz crackers. There are five different varieties. Um, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, the first time I tried the store was out of what they call classic Ritz crackers. It, it had only like, um, oh, I, I don't remember the varieties. They were like with caraway seeds or um, some other kind of cheese or a uh, honey maple. Right, we all know this, right? Packaged potato chips come in barbecue, mesquite, jalapeno, sour cream, onion flavor. I don't, I don't have to, to belabor this. 
Variety is the compensation for the fact that the original product, the basic product, um, is an industrial one. Uh, the next slide. Uh, but industrial products are, are, are were welcomed as such. They were novelties. Uh, they were um, things like Jello, versatile, uh, easy, uh, extremely inexpensive. Uh, I think most of us are used to Jello as a passe dessert, but uh, at the height of its popularity, it was made into salads, fruit salads like this one, but also uh, vegetable salads were very popular. And when I, when I moved to the South uh, to teach at Vanderbilt University at the end of the 1970s, uh, I, I was stunned to discover that they um, had um, what was called congealed salad. This is lime jello with vegetables in it as a vegetable option. Uh, and um, uh, it turned out that that's not re really Southern. It's just something that had existed in many parts of the country. Um, um, but after the Second World, it had, uh, World War, it had died out in most places. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. The small business aspect of marketing variety is the proliferation of so-called ethnic restaurants, places that serve a foreign cuisine marketed to generic Americans. I use the term ethnic restaurant, even though it's not favored, uh, and it's not favored for good reasons, but I use the word because it retains the condescending and self-described adventurous attitudes of the typical patron. The whole world has now an eclectic globalized cuisine as the authentic French tacos sign was intended to show. But it was the United States that pioneered this. Uh, this is just one of many uh, uh, possible menus showing a post-war, this is about 1950, uh, um, an Indian restaurant and notice the where foods are prepared by an experienced Hindu chef. So this is an appeal to authenticity. As I said, the United States pioneered, this begins in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, and um, a New York Times article in the 1890s said that while Paris might have uh, the best restaurants in the world, no place had the variety of New York. Uh, for restaurants. And a similar boast appears in the LA Times uh, a, a decade or so later. If you look at the 1965 Michelin Guide to France, uh, the Paris section lists 375 restaurants, and only six are from foreign countries. The rest are, not surprisingly, French. There may be some variety within France. There's Alsatian restaurants, Perigordin restaurants. Compare this to the New York Times first edition of its restaurant guide to dining out, also from 1965. It's subdivided into chapters listing Chinese, Italian, Indian, Japanese, Middle Eastern, Scandinavian, uh, Spanish food, and so forth. The 1970s would bring uh, Mexican, Thai, and Greek restaurants. Fondness for the food of immigrants then um, is a key to American dining patterns. And the crucial moment was 1896, when what was called the chop suey craze began. High Chinese government official described in the press as a viceroy was honored at the Waldorf Hotel in New York. And supposedly his chef prepared a dish whose exotic but accessible and delicious attributes created an instantaneous vogue. Uh, whatever the veracity of this story and, and it uh, uh, has uh, very little veracity, Chop suey did become a wildly popular item right after the Viceroy's trip. By 1905 in New York City, there were over a hundred chop suey restaurants outside of Chinatown. The oldest Chinese restaurant in the United States, and here it is in the next slide, is um, the Pekin Noodle Par Parlor in Butte, Montana. Uh, and it still has its chop suey sign. Uh, you may have heard a feature that uh, NPR did, I think on All Things Considered, uh, maybe three weeks ago. The second most successful immigrant cuisine was Italian. 
as with Chinese food, Italian dishes became popular beginning in the 1880s. The kind of Italian food served in restaurants, especially those catered to American born customers, bore only oblique resemblance to what was consumed in Italy. Italian Americans invented eggplant parmesan, marinara sauce, which is first attested in 1930, uh, and ricotta cheesecake. A Sicilian businessman joked in the 1920s that during a visit to the US, he had tried some fascinating American specialties like spaghetti and meatballs and veal parmigiana. And he couldn't wait for someone someday to bring these to Italy. Urban Bohemians, as they were called, uh, the ancestors of later yuppies and hipsters, were attracted by the unusual but approachable and expensive food, copious wine, and an ambiance uh, effectively marketed as irrepressible Italian spontaneity. Supposedly typical atmosphere was conveyed by mama in the kitchen, the dining room walls painted with gondolas or Mount Vesuvius and picturesque staging. This is the equivalent of the uh, food prepared by a Hindu chef um, uh, on the cover of that menu. Italian waiters presented themselves as convivial, colorful characters. A restaurant called Gonfaroni's in Greenwich Village uh, uh, had waiters who juggled plates, a, a busboy who uh, played a harmonica, and an enraged chef who uh, would chase the staff uh, around the dining room with a kitchen knife. Next slide. Here's another Indian restaurant called the Punjab. Uh, and it shows the way in which Restaurants play with authenticity and joke around with it, with pseudo authenticity. So uh, they've got um, uh, the, the uh, title of this page is Enjoy Our Exotic Cuisine. So they've got foods from the Far East. And then next to it, it says, Punjab says, try a king sized martini. Uh, and then uh, uh, a bottle of Van de Blanc with French foods. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, you know, this is the 1950s, what can I say? For an audience that cares more about authenticity than the patrons of the Punjab, though, it's still possible for restaurants, and not only possible, but this is what they do all the time. They manipulate the experience of authenticity. Uh, a certain kind of client wants to think that they discovered something or that they're having a kind of food uh, restaurant adventure. So um, the owners of a small chain called Xi'an Famous Foods that specializes in Sichuan uh, cuisine, uh, Sichuan noodles, um, you know, authentic more than 1970s Sichuan cuisine. Uh, they had a policy of employing only cashiers at their stands who did not understand English beyond numbers. Um, and the owner said in an interview that this was uh, uh, to give a sense of authenticity uh, that you were in China. All right, to summarize the situation that I see as dominating until the 1970s, fading regional cuisine, name brand processed foods, and a variety within brands to divert attention from the bland and slightly chemical taste of the basic products. The 1970s is the turning point in American food history. On, on the one hand, it's this decade in which the microwave oven was first marketed to households and when McDonald's and other fast food places spread to every highway off ramp. On the other hand, the 1970s witnessed a food revolution originating in what today is referred to as the farm to table movement. The emphasis on seasonal, local and sustainable food really is a change because restaurants now focus on taste and freshness, things that are hard to deliver in an industrial system. According to this idea, it's better to have a delicious tomato or peach in season than all the variety available from canned fruit. Now, I'll come back to the farm to table movement, but actually I'd like to spend a few minutes on one aspect of American cuisine in its social context. And I'm afraid now I'm gonna go back to the um, uh, mostly to pre 1970s paradigms. I want to talk about how men and women interact over food and the role of uh, food companies and advertisers in um, 
structuring and manipulating that. Uh, companies sold food to women um, based on convenience and price, but also according to a particular theory of marriage uh, that was um, supposedly applicable, applicable to the women that they wanted to reach, who were white, uh, middle class, and um, not working outside the home. While, while this is a minority of the population, uh, it was what the uh, companies considered to be their basic clientele, their best clientele. Magazines and other media exalted the housewife as the guardian of the family. Uh, next slide. Um, it was she who made sure that everybody ate according to scientific ideas of health um, marketed by advertisers and home economists. But she was also encouraged to be anxious about her husband's happiness uh, or unhappiness. This advertisement uh, for a brand of flour from the 1930s shows uh, the wife not only as the provider of nourishment, but of pleasure. The message is obviously that love is both stimulated and reinforced by cooking. One of the most popular cookbooks of the 20th century, often known as the Settlement House Cookbook, was entitled The Way to a Man's Heart. The downside of this is that men's attentions can stray and that sexual temptation can start with a culinary temptation. A letter to the fictitious Betty Crocker at General Mills in the 1930s said that the female writer usually made white cake uh, because she uh, uh, didn't like chocolate cake, but that her neighbor routinely served fudge cake. And the question was, is this neighbor woman angling to steal the writer's husband uh, and will she succeed? Next slide. Uh, this is from a, a stove company uh, instruction pamphlet uh, uh, datable to about 1962. So advertisers didn't just emphasize the uh, wife as provider of uh, food. Uh, they emphasize that husbands don't like their wives to be bedraggled by kitchen labor. They want hearty meals and an entertaining, svelte, and uh, amusing companion. Um, uh, it's not quite so clear in this slide, but uh, the woman, uh, you know, she has her hair up. She's wearing pearls. Uh, uh, she has an apron, but she's got a dress um, uh, that is appropriate for going out. They're, they're going to have dinner that she prepared that features a standing rib roast, um, uh, some kind of muffins and, you know, uh, other ambitious food. But um, uh, she's not uh, overwhelmed by kitchen labor, thanks to this stove, um, we are led to believe. What about women's own desires? Uh, are there gendered food preferences? Until the 19th century, there was no great distinction made between what men, when men and women liked to eat. At restaurants established for women dining alone or in groups, which were intended to protect them from male harassment, the same kinds of food as what were served to men prevailed. Uh, pig's feet, game, pork and beans, roast beef, and the like. In the New York Public Library's vast menu collection, the largest in the United States, the oldest menu is from a lady's ordinary, as these restaurants were called, uh, in 1843 in downtown New York. It features calves head with brain sauce, kidneys with fiends herb, uh, pig's feet sauce poulette, uh, and other uh, hearty dishes. The one specialty uh, uh, that was uh, supposedly preferred by women, or the one thing that women uh, supposedly like was ice cream. And before the Civil War, even, ice cream saloons, as they were called, drew female customers. They're often strategically located next to or near uh, dry goods stores to attract female shoppers. Um, by the 1890s, uh, this had expanded so that women liked sweet foods, ice cream, spectacular desserts, but also light entrees. This combination of light entrees and lavish desserts remained a, um, a, a common stereotype. Restaurants like Schraft's or Child's um, uh, featured this combination. 
Uh, so Schraff's had salads, uh, um, uh, sandwiches, um, cottage cheese dishes, uh, fruit and cottage cheese dishes, and then very elaborate sundaes uh, and uh, banana splits and the like for dessert. This gendering of food is significant in terms of what um, I was talking about with regard to the subordination of women's preferences to those of the men in their lives. Male food was supposed to be substantial, flavorful, and spicy. Uh, there's a 1941 article for Good Housekeeping uh, that expresses contempt for what the writer refers to as, quote, sissy food unquote, as opposed to what men can, uh, quote, sink their teeth into, unquote. Sissy food means uh, things decorated with mayonnaise, the writer explains, or whipped cream, or small amounts of creamed chicken or shrimp in pastry shells, uh, and of course, salads. The article listed man-pleasing dishes, such as steak, spaghetti and meatballs, chili, fried potatoes, mutton chops, sharp or runny cheeses, curry, Indian pudding. These lusty items were presented as antithetical to women's inclinations for processed foods, which were increasingly associated not only with convenience, but with um, a fundamental female aversion to real food. Uh, this notion that women don't actually like food all that much was both uh, supposedly because they have to make it all the time uh, and, and or because they're uh, more concerned about their looks or uh, uh, because of some alleged um, uh, lack of interest. Uh, so there are a whole number of male oriented cookbooks that appear um, after the First World War uh, with titles like A Thousand Ways to Please a Husband. 333 Ways to a Man's Heart, Feeding Father, and a particularly engaging title from 1925, Feed the Brute, with an exclamation mark. All of these acknowledged the sacrifice that women make in putting their husband's tastes for strongly flavored but simple food first, and, and basically recommended that, uh, you know, when you have your female friends over for lunch, then you can have what you like. According to Eleanor Howe, a noted cookbook writer of the time, any woman looking at the word menu should know that primacy must go to men rather than you. The next slide. Later, it was possible to imagine a closer and more egalitarian um, relationship between men and women with regard to food. Um, well, let's say pseudo egalitarian. Retaining the uh, association between sexual attraction and food, a cookbook put in, out in 1965 by the spy thriller writer Len Dayton, uh, he's the author of The Ipcress Files, shows a couple taking turns dealing with the pasta. Uh, taking turns. So this is the front cover. The man is uh, uh, ladling out the uh, spaghetti uh, and the woman is caressing him. The uh, next slide shows the back cover with the roles reversed. Um, cookbooks intended for men proliferated in the 1960s and 1970s, perpetuating notions of male hardiness versus female indifference. So the Playboy Gourmet, a, a very elaborate cookbook from 1972, uh, begins with the editor saying that um, this is addressed to bachelors who, you know, have a lusty, hearty uh, liking for food and a much greater creativity than women do. Women have a repetitive job cooking every day and so don't enjoy it. Uh, and then he says, quote, by contrast, every bachelor's passion for the cooking arts is always touched with excitement because he doesn't have to cook. And now, of course, gender rules have changed. Uh, some other developments of recent decades. Families don't eat together that often. Individuals have different allergies and food passions. Uh, teenagers are much more involved in food decisions, not only for themselves, uh, but for the family. Um, they're often the uh, advocates for vegetarianism uh, or even veganism. And uh, to a surprising degree, their parents listen to them. The middle aisles of the supermarkets have less traffic and companies like Campbell's or Kraft Heinz face a crisis 
because consumers are turning away from their familiar brands, which are now regarded as unhealthful and lacking in natural flavor. The rise of Whole Foods, of chain restaurants such as Sweet Greens and Chipotle, uh, of, of organic foods uh, whose growth in sales now doubles that of conventional food. These are all indications of the decline uh, of uh, the old model. Uh, the next slide. And the decline of the old model and the rise of uh, the farm to table movement, the revolt against homogeneity um, is not totally to be decredited to Alice Waters, the founder of the restaurant Chez Panisse in Berkeley in 1971. Uh, but certainly she um, advocated this uh, and her um, uh, movement has uh, uh, is responsible not only for the way that most restaurants um, uh, are uh, are now, but uh, a shift among, um, uh, you know, the the tasteful uh, people uh, of the country. These tasteful people of the country have sort of changed their minds. So uh, when I was a, um, when I first moved to the South in 1979, the stereotype of hillbillies or rural people was that they raised chickens in their backyard and put up their homegrown vegetables and fruit for the winter and this was thought to be kind of funny and amusing. Uh, people of taste and sophistication bought pâté de foie gras in cans and Scottish shortbread cookies in boxes. But now, of course, if they don't have the chickens in their backyard, um, uh, people of taste and sophistication pay other people to raise uh, farm um, uh, um, uh, free range chickens. Uh, and now the poor are stereotyped as addicted to fast food and hamburger helper. So a final aspect of what is uh, influencing food, not the final, the semi-final aspect is television and the food network. I can elaborate on that. Um, uh, the next and last slide shows uh, the man who really started food television and celebrity chefs in their current form, uh, Emeril Lagasse, uh, in the mid 1990s. Uh, the the last thing that's influencing, the most important thing, and of course the most unpredictable thing, is the pandemic. Um, clearly, the pandemic is going to and is in the process of destroying uh, restaurants. Estimates of how many are not going to reopen. I'd say the range is between 40 and 70%. Uh, and most of all in uh, big cities uh, uh, with uh, um, high rents and um, you know places where restaurants were already not um, uh, and marginally surviving. So I'd be glad to um, answer questions uh, to discuss the pandemic uh, uh, and its effects uh, a, a little more to the extent that, you know, my guess is probably as good as yours. Um, and so thank you very much. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, that was a fantastic talk. I learned so much uh, about history, about our uh, American culture uh, and about food. Um, and I want to encourage uh, all the uh, audience attendees to ask us questions as they come to your mind. Um, please use the Q&A function at the, at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom panel. Um, I have a couple for you, Paul, as, as they start to come, come in. Um, and, and for those that don't know me, my name is Patrick Spear. I'm the, the librarian here. And uh, Paul, I, I first met you and, and thought of you as a medievalist. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's something that Andy talked about as well. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, your journey um, from being a, a medieval historian, uh, who, who, which I'm sure you still are, uh, but also writing and thinking pretty deeply about food. Yeah, well, I'll preface my answer uh, <clears throat> with um, an experience I had at the Medieval Academy of America when it met at Notre Dame <clears throat> a few years ago. I gave a paper on a medieval cookbook uh, from Catalonia, uh, two medieval cookbooks actually. And, um, uh, a colleague, uh, whom I know quite well, um, gently but uh, pointedly asked me, no, he, he, he asked me a question, but then asked the audience, oh, by the way, whatever happened to the Paul Friedman of the Origins of Peasant Servitude in Medieval Catalonia, a book that I'd written in the 1990s, you know, like, oh, what happened to you? What, what, uh, what Timothy Leary-like experience did you have? So, um, 
Yeah, I uh, uh, there's a short answer, and I, I won't go on about my own um, uh, evolution. The short answer is that I was always interested in class and um, the imagery of class. I wrote a book called um, Images of the Medieval Peasant. Uh, and was struck in working on that by how many food stereotypes of peasants uh, and then uh, kind of reciprocal stereotypes of what lords eat there were in the literature about the classes of society. And uh, I then wrote a book about spices in, and the demand for spices in the Middle Ages, published in 2008, that really was focused on why spices were a symbol of uh, aristocratic prestige. That's great. Um, so, uh, based on your, you know, your knowledge now about medieval cuisine, is there any legacies of that medieval past in American cuisine today? Well, not exactly directly, um, but uh, Americans have a tastes in food that are closer to that of the Middle Ages than uh, Europe, for example. Uh, Americans like a mixture of sweet. Um, uh, 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 Americans don't exile sweet dishes to, or sweet effects, I should say, to dessert, the way um, Europeans do. Uh, Americans like, are, are not aware of the degree, I think, to which we have sugar in things like barbecue sauce, um, honey glazed ham or glazed hams of any sort. Uh, salad dressings, bottled salad dressings, like so-called French dressing uh, is actually sweet. Um, um, the aforementioned maple syrup, uh, which uh, people in Europe uh, uh, that I know don't know what to do with. Uh, they don't understand what it's for. Um, uh, these are things that are peculiarly, uh, peculiarly American. Right. So, uh, you know, that's, that's as medieval as we are, uh, get. But I think it is actually uh, shares the kind of taste uh, of an era in which, you know, for example, cinnamon and Parmesan were sprinkled uh, uh, along with sugar on uh, pasta. That's great. We've got a lot of questions coming in now. So let me uh, turn, turn over to Ron Fairman, a uh, fellow member of the APS. Uh, and he's wondering if there are similar uh, restaurant guides um, uh, like the, the Green Guide, but for, for black travelers. Uh, uh, the Green Guide for Black Travelers was mostly for places to stay. Um, it does mention uh, a food uh, available, uh, but it was um, <clears throat> it was more a lodging than a um, uh, yeah. Is the the question though? Is it that um, you know are there guides for particular um, yeah? Of course, there are guides like uh, for people traveling with children or. Um, uh, there was a, a series offered by Jane and Michael Stern called Road Food beginning in 1978 uh, that was kind of for the traveler seeking something other than fast food or junk food. Uh, you know, where can you still get country ham or where off the highway are you going to find like the ideal lobster roll or clam shack in New England? Right. Um, a question from Dennis McLeod, which is a historical question, and that's um, did victory gardens of the Second World War, where people were growing their own gardens, have any impact on uh, American cuisine? Uh, not a permanent one. And, and this is a great question because it's a little bit like the speculation, will the pandemic, which has made people you know, rediscover their kitchens and cook at home much more than they were doing, will the pandemic result in a long-term change as Americans uh, either have learned to cook, rediscovered how to cook, uh, have decided maybe that cooking is healthier than dining out? In other words, when it is possible to go back to restaurant dining and Americans before the pandemic spent more money dining out than at, at home, uh, you know, will, will that, uh, uh, my guess is it probably won't. Just like Victory Gardens, people, people grew that stuff and then they stopped right after the war, right after rationing ended and, you know, the emergency uh, was perceived as, as being over. The people who continued to garden were the people who had been gardening before the declaration of war. Great. Um, I have two very similar questions, uh, one from Ainley uh, Dixon and another from uh, uh, Frank Gruber. Um, they're also, they're, they're, they're both about American taste. And Ainley says, would you uh, say Americans like milder, more bland food than other uh, cultures? And uh, Frank uh, no, asked why hamburger never really appeared in your talk. And 
Uh, what about the concept that integral to American food is the, that it needs to fit on one plate, meat, meat starch, and vegetables? Yeah. Uh, so um, there's a kind of paradox about blandness. Uh, the tastes uh, have historically been bland, uh, but there's been always resistance to it. So Americans love to start with a bland thing like, you know, filet mignon uh, um, uh, or, um, you know, chicken the way it comes now or pork, lean pork, which have almost no flavor, but then add all sorts of sauces, uh, hot sauces, for example. When I did my dissertation work in Catalonia, I lived with a very well-off family. The food was wonderful. I gained 10 pounds, but I was dying for hot sauce. Uh, and my parents visited me there and I asked them to bring me, uh, you know, as many different kinds of hot sauce as they could. And the people I lived with thought this was hilarious. I mean, they thought it was probably disgusting, but um, uh, uh, Americans love piquant sauces. Um, they like to dress things up with, you um, uh, sweet or spicy or salty or preferably all three. Uh, Americans' tastes are actually not so much bland. They're for sweet, salty, uh, and spicy. And then what was the last part of the question? Uh, it, it was about the blandness. So the, the idea no, no, there was something else, though, um, in, in, in there. Uh, other than bland. oh yeah, hamburger. So, um, and, and the plate being divided. The plate being divided is um, typical of modern Western cuisine. And it's referred to uh, by uh, the food historian Massimo Montanari as um, analytic cuisine, where you know uh, uh, what you're eating, it's separate. And the French, food reform, as it was regarded, uh, was a simplification in the 17th, 18th centuries, where, as one advocate said, cabbage should taste like cabbage, uh, where the thing should be intensified. The sauce should intensify the chicken or the fish, uh, not cover it up in the way that medieval sauces uh, supposedly did. A synthetic cuisine, on the other hand, is one in which the basic ingredient is less important than the sauce, than the spectrum of flavors of the sauce. So Indian or Mexican food is synthetic. It's not so as important, you know, whether it's pork or shrimp or chicken. What's important is the, uh, the nature of the sauce and the, uh, the uh, complexity of its flavors. Great, so I have uh, two more uh, serious questions, uh, shall we say, and then one, one last one that's a, a fun question we'll end on. Um, so a question from uh, um, Yvonne uh, Lefevre. Um, what role did World's Fairs uh, contribute to American foods? Um, I, I'd like to uh, look at this more seriously. Certain things like the 1964-65 World's Fair uh, contributed the Belgian waffle, which is now kind of hard to find, but uh, uh, certainly well uh, into the 1990s uh, was a, 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 big, uh, a big item. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, certain foods were discovered by fairs, but certain foods were popularized by world's fairs that were not foreign. So the Belgian waffle was served at the Belgian pavilion uh, in, in New York, which looked like a castle. But the hot dog seems to have been popularized uh, by the St. Louis Fair of, uh, of 1905. Wow. Um, a question from Mark uh, Kerchak. Um, when did uh, men become high-powered status chefs. And if you could also maybe take that in, in more generally, what, when did celebrity chefs develop and what role have, have those had? So there have always been celebrity chefs, often in that kind of patronizing, you know, excellent servant, excellent craftsperson way that I mentioned with regard to African-American chefs. So uh, James Prosser is a celebrity chef. Uh, um, the uh, Apicius is a legendary uh, chef and connoisseur of the Roman, em uh, Roman Empire. Um, the first real celebrity chef maybe is Taillevent, 
uh, chef to the king of France in the 14th century. Uh, he was knighted by the king of France. His tomb shows him with a sword uh, and his coat of arms. His coat of arms is three marmites, you know, three little saucepans. So uh, this is, again, a somewhat patronizing honor. But the modern celebrity chef is in two phases, in my opinion. One is the chef no longer is a craftsman, but a creator, a genius, an artist. And I would say that begins with Paul Bocuse, the French chef um, in the 1970s. So he separates himself out from those who are the tenders of a tradition like Escoffier, Carême, uh, or the Toigro brothers uh, with whom uh, he was often compared. Um, he is kind of, you know, the originator of dishes. Uh, and then this gets really kicked into high gear by Ferran Adria at the restaurant El Bouilly, which, you know, was the most celebrated restaurant from the late 90s until it closed at the height of its fame in 2011. Uh, and, and Adria exemplifies the chef as genius and artist. The American celebrity chef, however, is uh, related to television and not just television as instructional. So I would say that Julia Child is not a celebrity chef. Uh, she was just, you know, a great TV chef, a great popularizer, um, you know, a great chef. The celebrity chef is someone who is not in the kitchen and not giving instruction. So Anthony Bourdain became a celebrity chef, not because he cooked stuff at the, the restaurant Les Halles. Uh, uh, he, um, uh, he became a celebrity chef through TV. He was an adventurer. He went to all kinds of places and ate all sorts of weird stuff. Um, so the celebrity chef for uh, the first part of the 21st century was um, usually male, usually a kind of lovable bad boy, uh, tattoos, uh, noisy. Um, the Me Too movement, uh, among other things, has pretty much stopped that in its tracks. Uh, the new celebrity chefs, uh, the model for the new celebrity chef is uh, Jose Andres, uh, compassionate, um, crusader for social justice. Um, but, but although Jose Andres does a great job of this, I, I don't see this as fitting the formation of most chefs. I, a sensitive chef, a thoughtful, compassionate chef. Um, they exist, but that's, that's not been the model. That's not the form of training. Uh, that would be like a, um, a thoughtful, um, witty, compassionate uh, cardiologist. Thanks. Um, uh, so uh, the last question is actually from an anonymous uh, attendee, um, and they note that tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. Indeed. And, uh, their uh, particular question was if you had any stories about potato latkes, uh, but uh, more generally, um, I don't know if you could talk about the influence of Jewish uh, cuisine on America. Well, uh, Jewish cuisine uh, fascinates me. I'm actually working on a talk to be given, uh, alas, remotely uh, at the University of Haifa on Jewish cuisine in the United States. So on the one hand, it's not a success story, uh, you know, in the way that Italian uh, food is a success story. Uh, third generation Italians still cook Italian food. Third generation Jews, apart from the uh, Haredi uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, do not, or they do only on special occasions. So you can categorize American immigrants' foods by those that um, survive intact, more or less, and those that survive only for holidays. Um, Jewish food eaten by people who are not Jewish uh, there never was a tremendous vogue, except for some restaurants um, that were sort of like show business uh, 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 restaurants like the Romanian Jewish restaurant Moskowitz and Lupowitz on the Lower East Side. Um, delis, uh, but in fact, delis are almost extinct. Uh, there are a lot of things that call themselves delis now, but they're just, you know, they're just basically places to get uh, sandwiches and, uh, you know, self-service buffet uh, stuff. Um, bagels. Uh, okay, you know, bagels, bagels to me are like the Strand is to bookstores. Uh, the Strand bookstore in New York, you know, it's this gigantic used bookstore um, that is one of what used to be dozens of bookstores uh, around Fourth Avenue. Uh, it's the only survivor. And so the bagel is kind of like that. It's a success, all right, 
Um, and so much so that in places, like I remember when bagels came to Nashville, they came not only, you know, in what I consider to be their canonical form, you know, plain or onion or sesame or poppy, but blueberry bagels or raspberry bagels. Once again, the American love of variety. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Jewish food, there are some movements. Uh, there's a wonderful website uh, called uh, Gefilteria. Uh, uh, that attempts to revive uh, Ashkenazic cuisine. So that's my answer. And I can see that my cat is saying that uh, uh, we're done here. Uh, uh. <laughs> As my grandmother used to say, uh, for those that haven't eaten yet, uh, bon appetit. And thank you for giving us this, uh, this great treat uh, tonight, Paul. This is wonderful. Thanks to all of you. Thanks. I enjoyed it.